Ba 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 It is the last UFC card of the year. We just had it last night. We had UFC Vegas 66 slash whatever other names it has. It was the Strickland versus Jared Kennedy year card. I am Mio. This is Mio on MMA. Let's talk about the card. But first, let's talk about yeah, some, like, I guess you could call it news items. Uh, Jake Shields obviously doing something dumb, which is not news in itself. Uh, essentially, he was called a Nazi. And then he went and slapped the guy who called him a Nazi, which was Mike Jackson. I think former UFC fighter, former CM Punk opponent, whatever. And then put him in the most aggressive side control you have ever seen in a gym scuffle. It was really weird. Anyways, Shields is now suing, uh, or trying to sue, Mike Jackson for de- defamation. And Mike Jackson is, <laughs> is trying to get Jake Shields charged with assault, which I imagine will be really, really easy because it's all on camera. Conor McGregor wants to fight at 185, apparently, or wants to fight 185ers. By the way, this is after, like, weeks of people saying Conor McGregor is not actually any bigger than he was before the injury. That is the Conor's fans' take. The man wants to fight two weight classes above where he was and is talking about how he might be two weight classes larger now. I don't think he is actually middleweight size because he's five foot seven, but um, that goes out the door, I think. And we'll round this off with Sean O'Malley actually having a, I guess, good guy moment. He apparently turned down Ramazan Kadyrov, the Chechen dictator, leader, warlord, MMA strongman. Uh, He turned down his money to show up at his uh, son's birthday party. Which is good, because other fighters, notably Kamaru Usman, Henry Cejudo, and Justin Gaethje, despite the fact that Justin Gaethje has denied this, uh, absolutely did take that money and absolutely did show up. So there you go. (laughs) Um, And there's a lot of whataboutism on this. Like, go 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 to a social media article. Or bloody elbow, or MMA fighting, whatever go, MMA website with with a comment section, and you will get people going. Well, what about insert American leader and their death count essentially? Be that like Bush with the war in Iraq, Obama with the continuation of that drone drone strikes, etc. Um, someone very passionately went after Bill Clinton. That was a little bit weird. Uh, not that like, not that I'm endorsing Bill Clinton or anything, but uh, just like on a on a body count level, compared to the presidents around him, uh, kind of low. Um, here's the thing: unless you can point at the MMA fighter in question going out of their way to take paid engagements to promote insert leader. Be this the leader of France, the UK, United States, whatever. Then it's not actually really talking about the topic. Because the conversation, if you want to say that like MMA fighters should have no sports washing appeal, no political um, cachet, I am down with that. And I poo pooed any, I, I poo pooed. The MMA fighters such as Colby Covington who supported Donald Trump. Not because you can't, not because that's not their right, but because I think it's stupid. I think the political value of a fighter supporting any leader is null and void. But Kataroff believes it is the case. And presumably there is something that suggests that he gains legitimacy through this sports washing. Kind of like Qatar going for the World Cup. And when it, what it comes down to at the end is they are taking money and not, not expressing their own political views. I want to make that clear because they're taking the money. If they, if they just simply were misinformed or free thinkers who believe Kataroff is a good leader or whatever, they wouldn't take the cash. 
which they definitely are. So, anyways, Sean O'Malley, good guy moment, MMA fan base, confusing as always. Moving on to the fight card, Jared Cannonier versus Sean Strickland was the main event. And there's a lot of talk about this card being poorly scored. Um, mostly because if you look at the decision here, Judge Derek Cleary gave all the rounds but the fourth round to Cannonier. Sal D'Amato gave all the rounds but the fourth one to Sean Strickland. Instantly, we have a weird one here where you have agreed on absolutely zero rounds. And then Judge uh, Janichiro uh, Kamijo scored all but the third round for Cannonier. Cannonier wins 48-46, uh, split decision. The media seems to have generally favored Cannonier. There's even a 50-45 uh, one from CBS Sports, which is... That's a bit weird. Um, not necessarily wrong, but that's a bit weird. And there are a couple that scored it for Strickland. The heaviest Strickland scorecard being 46, 49, 46, uh, courtesy of Dane Fox over at Bloody Elbow. Let's talk about the rounds themselves. Okay, so in the first and the second round, I don't think a tremendous amount happened beyond the fact that you're just looking at punch for punch, a little bit better quality, whatever. So kind of a question of volume quality. I saw those two rounds for Strickland. I thought he landed more in both cases. Uh, UFC stats does disagree with me because they think Cannoneer outlanded Strickland in the first round. So, okay, maybe that one goes to Cannoneer. But at the same time, like there was also, I think, the most dominant moment in that round was when Strickland caught Cannoneer's kick, dumped him on his back, got a little bit of back control from the clinch and started landing some pretty reasonable uppercuts. Like, I think he had the highest quality strikes of the round. And like I said, I think he also landed more. I had, um, granted, to be clear, none of these rounds have much volume differential. I think the the, the highest one I came up with watching and just kind of doing the tra- tracking of stats was Strickland being a plus six in one round. And according to UFC stats, the biggest gap was six. Sean Strickland landing six more strikes in the fourth round than Jared Cannonier. I think the second round has to go to Strickland. I think he outlanded him. UFC stats agrees. And he started to actually start pushing Cannonier around the octagon. This was the only round where he put Cannonier on his back foot. Cannonier did have a very strong finish. Maybe that's why some people went the other way, because I know some people scored this at 2018 at this point. So I'm I'm ambivalent about round one. Round two, I do think, went to Strickland. Round three is a toss-up again. Per UFC stats, the striking gap was two strikes. And I think they both hurt each other during the round. Because Cannonier got scaggered a little bit twice, not rocked. No one got rocked in this fight. I want to be clear. When I'm when I say hurt, I mean like just given pause, staggered. Clearly, the body language indicating that there's a cob, there's a star to. But at the at the at the same time, Cannonier did hurt him like kind of badly at the end of the round. So there you go. And then the fourth round, I had that one going to Cannonier. That one I think was Cannonier's round. He had I thought the best, the most damaging shots of the fight in that fourth round, particularly right at the end where he hit him with a big overhand that had Strickland kind of skittering around the cage, being a little bit banged up. But apparently, again, Strickland did land more. That was actually the biggest gap. That was the six strike gap in volume per UFC stats. But at the same time, I think the damage outweighed it. So round two to Strickland, round four to Cannonier, one and three are toss-ups. And I gave Cannonier the fifth round because I thought he had the best work there. That being said, I also am looking at my notes here. Strickland had him staggered four times to Cannoneer's two. Oh, wait, I'm reading my score backwards. I had it for Strickland. Okay, there you go. Um, yeah, so I scored, I scored one, two, five for Strickland. I think two has to go to Strickland. I think four has to go to Cannoneer. 
I think the other three three um, rounds have a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of play to be given. This being said, um, that does mean that I think that uh, Derek Cleary's scorecard is wrong because he gave the second round to Cannoneer and the fourth round to Strickland, which is the reverse of how I think that should go. And I think that uh, Camillo's uh, card is also wrong because he gave Strickland the second round. I have no objection to Sal D'Amato's card. I don't agree with it, but like, uh, well, no, I actually, you know what? I, I, I do kind of agree with it. Um, don't get me wrong. It scored differently. I scored it for Strickland. He scored it for Cannoneer. I mean, that's a, or he scored it for, pardon me. He did. He scored it for Strickland. I scored it for Strickland. That's the closest one to being in agreement. He agreed with me on the second and the fourth round. He gave one, three, and five to Strickland. I gave three to Cannoneer. But that's perfectly fine. Anyways, I'm not going to die on this hill. Based on, on the level of controversy of these recent cards, Patty Pimblett, Jared Gordon is still a objectively worse decision than this one in every way, shape, or form. Maybe, maybe it's because I dislike Patty Pimblett quite heavily and I dislike Sean Strickland quite heavily <laughs> and um, Pimblett got the win, Strickland got the loss. Maybe that's why I'm okay with it. But it does seem like social media in general has kind of a similar view. Uh, Cannoneer wanted a top, uh, basically wanted a number one contender fight after this. I don't think he's going to get that. I think that there are hotter properties right now. Even if Israel Adesanya doesn't get the belt back. And if Izzy gets the belt back, then Cannoneer is dead in the water. No one wants to see Izzy versus Cannoneer too. Uh, but I've got him facing the winner of maybe Delitze versus Marvin Vittori. I've got Sean Strickland fighting Derek Brunson, just as kind of like, I'm a little surprised this fight hasn't happened already. And I don't think either of them really are players in the, in the title conversation because in Izzy's case, or pardon me, in Brunson's case, he has a definitive loss to Izzy Adesanya and Pahea has definitively beaten Strickland. So I, I don't think either of them are really in there. I don't, I don't necessarily think Cannoneer is either, but like Cannoneer feels, despite having more recently fought for the title, feels more fresh. Armin Saryuki and Demir Ismagulov. This fight went exactly how I thought it was going to go, to be honest, because I said Saryukian is just too strong, too physical. And in the stand-up exchanges... I'm not really going to talk about this round by round. I scored all three rounds for Saryuki. And if you gave one to Ismagulov, fine. That's perfectly fine. But um, when it comes down to it, Saryukian, despite being outstruck, because Ismagulov is a much better striker. He is a phenomenal technician, particularly with the jab. Saryukian was able to make more impact with his strikes. He's just too much of an athlete. I... I that is, I guess, what I, I was. I was hoping to be wrong because uh, I'm a big, I'm a big proponent of solid fundamentals, structure, nuance, technicality over athleticism. That is my, that is my dream world where the best technical fighters are the best fighters in the world. But this is the world that Ismagulov exists in. He's just not impactful enough. Not strong enough, not explosive enough, not fast enough. And Armin was able to constantly force a grappling, wrestling approach onto him, take him down, could not hold him down worth a damn, but get him down, get the uh, strikes in, and just smother uh, Ismagulov's offense and never let him get going, really. Uh, I'm kind of curious what the strikes were here. Uh, Ismagulov outlanded him in the first round and Armin had slight edges in the second and the third round. But of course, also mixed in seven takedowns, nine minutes and 25 seconds of control time. Did not do a ton with it because Ismagulov is a very good grappler. Ismagulov is a better technician in every regard. Again. He just is not nearly the athlete Saryukin is. And uh, 
that's what you get. Uh, looking at the cards here. Uh, Mike Bell had my card, giving it 3027. Oh, they all gave 3027. So none of the judges gave is Magulov around. I don't even know what round you would have given it to. But I feel like I feel like there's an incentive with some people, like they don't want to give a close fight, which this was a 3027. It, it feels it feels wrong, and I get it. But um, yeah, I think he won all these rounds. Uh Saryukin afterwards did have kind of lost denial syndrome with Gamrot. He's like, I'm on a seven fight win streak. I did not lose to Gamrot. Well, you did. And I I get that that was a close fight, controversial scorecard and everything. And I want to say I scored it for Saryukin, actually. But you did lose on paper. And there is a very legitimate argument watching the fight that Gamrot did win. So that that was a little bit stupid. He wants someone top five-ish. I kind of agree. And that's why I have him put it facing off against Benil Dariush. Because him and Dariush are in the same problem zone i think where i don't think the ufc sees them as horrendously marketable or or if they do i think they see them as marketable to the same market as islam makachev and the problem with that is is that they're only going to push one of those guys right now and that kind of cuts them off from being in the title contention so put them up against each other Maybe the winner of that can make a statement and move into title consideration and kind of get us away from this triumvirate of Poirier, Gaethje, and well, I, I guess it's a it's a quad actually. It's a quad uh, quadrant. I, I don't know what a triumvirate with uh, with four is actually, um, but Gaethje, Chandler, Poirier, and Charles Oliveira. Um, that's their problem. And of course, you also have Volkanovsky getting a title shot. So like, it's a long ways away. Do the Benil Dariush fight. And for Isma Gulov, I have Grant Dawson. Because Grant Dawson is a good athlete. But one that is in, still very unrefined. But is getting better. So like putting Isma Gulov's technicality up against his physicality would be interesting for both guys to see where they are. Maybe is Magulov actually can be a better athlete, and maybe Dawson can show off a better technical game and 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 get a win that kind of means something. Because Dawson's wins, Grant Dawson has a lot of impressive wins here, but they're all kind of they're all kind of one defining point. Like Mark Madsen's a great wrestler. But when he couldn't get a wrestling game going on him, Dawson beat him. Jared Gordon gives off his back a lot. Len- uh, Leonardo Santos is getting quite old. Nadine Armani just kind of not physically up there. I guess Nadine Armani is kind of a similar version to Isma Gulov in that regard. But Isma Gulov is a bigger test on that. And then the Derek Minner and Mike Trezano wins, which I just don't think really mean a lot at all. And of course, then we're back into his featherweight days where he beat uh, Julian Arosa and Adrian Diaz. <laughs> Um, I think that's an interesting fight. I think it's a legitimately interesting fight for both guys. Amir al largely just out, 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 outclassed, um, outclassed uh, Alessandro Costa, which is not surprising because this was Costa was the third or fourth opponent. I know there was Roy Val and Eric Perez before, or Alex Perez before this. And essentially, al was able to when he decided to put his stamp on the fight, do so with ease. When he felt comfortable throwing big strikes and getting takedowns, he was able to do it pretty easily. But he was kind of super low energy against Costa. Part of that, I think, is because Costa doesn't force you to go very fast. And again, this being a replacement opponent, late notice, I think there was a little bit of worry. And Costa is a hard hitter. Like Costa is a legitimately hard hitter. But the thing with Costa that really worries me is that he's not he's not a physical beast enough to do his super low output style. And I think that was the problem here is that Albazi was leaving room for him to get offense in. And he wasn't doing it. And when Albazi decided to go on the attack, he was able to bully Costa 
uh, pretty pretty easily. He was able to hurt him a number of times with strikes. He was able to get takedowns pretty much as he wanted. And he eventually uh, picked up the the knockout in the third round when he st- sat him down with a hard counter-strike. Uh, Albazi apparently doesn't have a car right now because his car broke down and was begging. Well, not, not begging. He was asking for the 50 Gs. This was a step above the begging for 50 Gs. Uh, but he did not get it, which just continues to point out the fact that you can have a sob story ready and you can have a request for money ready and the UFC will not give it to you. Uh, he also did call out uh, Morocco for their great run at the World Cup, which deserves a tup- tip of the hat. I'm less inclined to be big about his, like, call, his, uh, like, and, and a shout out to, like, the people of Qatar for representing our values. Uh, or Qatar. I, I uh, that, that's a weird spot. I mean, I don't, I, I don't, I don't know why I kind of expected Al Bazi to be a little bit more forward thinking. He's Iranian, but, like, he grew up in Sweden, is my recollection. He immigrated to the UK and then to the United States. I, if these are your beliefs, then I, I don't know why you're not back there. I, I guess that's what it, what it comes down to. Uh, next matchup, rebook Albazi versus Roy Val. Have a really good backup standing by because Roy Val gets hurt a lot. Probably because he's a crazy man. And Costa versus CJ Vergara is just kind of like the ultimate kind of like the two super bottom flyweights. Like in the case of Costa, it's being too inactive. In the case of Vergara, it's just not being physical enough and and see what happens. Uh, Alex Caceres bombed out Julian Arosa with a head kick and uh, cool. Had a really weird post fight. Really weird post fight. Uh, Put him up against uh, Jonathan Pierce. Pierce is a big guy. We'll see if, like, Caceres will still cons- consent to, like, a clinch grappling affair. Or if he'll take advantage of Pierce's, like, really lacking range striking game. And Julian Arosa versus Pat Sabatini. Assuming Sabatini is still around, I just haven't heard anything, no- any noise about him lately. He wouldn't have been cut, but... um, I wonder if maybe, like, he's he fought out his contract or something. I don't know. But that's what I got. Uh, Drew Dober had a great comeback against Bobby Green. He was getting lit up by Bobby Green. Bobby Green was doing all the things I thought he was going to do. At one point, he was up 23 to 6 in six strikes. He was doing the business. He was bobbing. He was weaving. He was rolling. He was setting Dober up for hard counters. And then Dober still just whacked him. (laughs) <laughs> I was literally typing in my notes. Dober is, is coming up a little bit short here. Green is, but Green is kind of also slowing down a little bit, landing mostly le- low kicks. I'd love to see him pick that up a little bit. And then bam, Dober knocked him out. Um, Yeah, cool. Uh, He's the second man to do that, I think. Dustin Poirier was the first. Also in his post-fight speech, he also stepped up and said that he uh has the most knockouts at lightweight tied with Poirier. So Dustin Poirier getting a, Weird tie into this card. Uh, and he called out Jalen Turner. I have no reason to not give him that fight. It's a scary fight. But I still have a lot of questions about Jalen Turner. And uh, Dober presents a challenge to possibly uh, possibly have a couple of those answered. And for Bobby Green, I put Mike ja- Michael Johnson in there. I don't want to see either of these guys wrestle. So putting them in there with each other, letting them just do slick, fast boxing, which they are very, very good at, is a fun fight. And they're of comparable ages because I think they're 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 both running out of time. Like they their their careers have been probably honestly longer than anyone thought they were gonna be. So, you know, let that happen. Uh Cody Brunridge scored an early takedown against uh, Michael Oleksajic or Mikhail Oleksajic. But Oleksajic uh Took advantage of a really, really, really sloppy transition where Brunridge was on Oleg Sage's back. Started to lose the position. Kind of thought, okay, maybe I can go for mount. And it did not work. And Oleg Sage gets on top. Lands some great ground and pound. 
and eventually the stoppage comes. Like, Brundridge does what he can, but dude does not have a game off of his back. Oleg Sajic, the victory. Called out Chris Curtis. Down for that fight. Why not? Brundridge versus Marc-Andre Barrio. Cheyenne Velismus, uh lost to Corey McKenna, but to be honest, it was more her just losing the fight than Corey winning. Like, I, I, I want to... I want to say nice things about Corey McKenna. She seems like a, a lovely person and she did what she needed to do to get the W here. Which was that once she was convinced that she had to wrestle to win, she did it and won the second and the third round. So I want to get credit for that. But Velismus more or less was the, like her shortcomings were, the, were, were what defined this. She was either really, really willing to be put back against the cage or to, or did not know how to stop it from happening, which I have noticed in the past. She is, she is very willing to get put against the cage. And that was where the takedowns were coming from. McKenna was able to neutralize her despite the lisp is going for some stuff from the guard. There wasn't a ton of damage, but obviously, if you're on front, if you're on top, and you're landing some stuff, and you even had a nice big slam there in the second round, you've got yourself a win. I still think McKenna is very hard capped. She has an incredibly limited reach, and she has a case, a really bad case of pad hitter syndrome. She's aiming for a target that's like where the pad would be in a sparring drill or in a hands drill, and she's kind of hitting that. Like she comes up short a lot of the time. Added to the bad reach and the fact that she needs to be convinced to wrestle. And I don't necessarily think she's a great wrestler. Maybe I'm wrong on that, but I don't think she's a great wrestler. Um, I do think she's still hard capped. I've got her fighting Pollyanna Viana in her next fight. Viana is a good athlete with some better jujitsu chops than Cheyenne Velismus has. So maybe an interesting idea. And for Velismus, I have, if she's still on contract, because I've not heard her getting booked for anything in a long time, uh, Brianna Fortino, uh, a.k.a. Brianna Van Buren, um, I think was her name before. Am I wrong on that? Brianna Van Buren. Yeah, Brianna, uh, Brianna Fort, uh, Fortino, born Brianna Van Buren. She got married. And yeah, she has not fought in the UFC since 2020. But she was booked in 2022 to fight Jessica Penne and then withdrew. So assuming she's still around, I do legitimately think that would be a fun fight. Because the big question with Velismus is, if you take away her athletic, like athletic edges, can, does she still function? And Fortino was very, very athletic. Jake Matthews looked like crap. Against Matt Semmelsberger. It's not that he lost to Semmelsberger. I want to make that clear. But he had. He had no answers for two rounds. He was getting picked off. He was getting hit hard. He was. He was landing this like lovely left check hook. But he was getting hit every time he did it. And he never adapted to what Semmelsberger was doing. And even in the third round, when he did finally start doing some uh, some stuff, it was not the type of thing you need to do. Like you, you needed to finish at this point. You had lost. You had lost two rounds easily, and he's just content to kind of ride top position and play around on the ground and not sell out hard for a submission or try to make a connection on the feet. Um, it was a bad performance. Not, like it's not that the fight was like super one-sided or anything. It just was a bad performance. And I guess I have to revise Jake Matthews right back down to where I had him because of course the Fialo fight was like, hey, some things are coming together here. Like I know Fialo has some significant limitations. He hesitates when he's pressuring, which is a really bad idea. Leaves him open to getting countered really badly. And then he lost to Muslim Salikov. But I was like, I still like a lot of what Matthews is putting together here. Things look good. Things, you know, he's reading things well. He did not read things well at all here. And Matt Semmelsberger gets the win. I've got Jake Matthews against Chaos Williams. And I've got Semmelsberger against the aforementioned 
Muslim Salikov. Saeed Nurmega Madoff and um, Sayyub Yakub Kakranamath. Um, Nurmega Madoff just got kind of wrestled boned in the first round. He got smothered. He got taken down. Uh, he went for a guillotine. Did not finish it, which is a bad idea. You know, did show off some creative stuff at range, but mm, man, uh, I may have to reevaluate this because I, I, I had thought that simply moving forward and pressuring Saeed Nurmagomedov was actually a relatively difficult thing to do. And uh, this made it look quite easy. And I don't think it's necessarily that I thought Kok Romanov was worse than he is. I just, I just think that Saeed has maybe bigger glaring holes than I thought. He did pick up the win here with a guillotine choke. But he was not doing well. Not doing well at all. But Saeed gets the win. Put him up against Ricky Simone. Because he's high enough profile right now that the fight makes sense. Ricky Simone is a good counter puncher. He's a good wrestler. He's a good pressure guy. And to me, that will be a win for Ricky Simone against Saeed Nurmagomedov. And hopefully on the basis that Nurmagomedov will kind of reinvent himself, take that loss, and hopefully do something. Because I think he really does have all the tools. He just needs to put things together. He needs to put more of an emphasis on keeping range. And uh, for some reason, I'm tickled pink by the idea of Kakramanov versus Davy Grant. Mahashente versus Hafa Garcia. This was probably the fight I was most wrong about on the entire card. Uh, I guess you could argue that I was really wrong on the dynamic of Matthews versus uh, Semmelsberger and also Nurmagomedov versus Kakramanov. So it, it, it certainly wasn't the only <laughs> uh, mistake I had. But um, this is the one that I do feel like I, I, I really screwed up on. Because I, I thought that Mahashete would have the physical power to just kind of win clinch exchanges with Rafa Garcia. And he could not. He absolutely could not. He got mauled in a wrestling, grappling sense. I gave Garcia all three rounds. Um, this was the fight where we ended up with Dominic Cruz talking about damage and being obsessed with it. I feel like Dominic Cruz's idea of damage is strictly superficial damage. Like he's like he's talking about like maybe you got to cut him to get some damage in there to get it back. No, you can you can hurt the guy. You can hit him really hard. You can hit him really clean. You can rock him. You can stagger him. You can knock him down. These are all options, Dom. But it feels like Dom doesn't Dom sees damage as like just this superficial thing that wins fights. And sometimes he's not wrong. More than once, I've wondered if a fighter lost a fight because he's bleeding and his opponent isn't. That's quite possible. But specifically speaking with the judging criteria, damage is not like cuts, that kind of thing. The, the, they, they are damage, but like damage is anything leading towards a possible fight stoppage. That's what that is. Like a, a hard right hand to the eye socket is damage, not just cuts. Um, it's interesting. It's it's interesting how little how the commentary team often goes off of off on tangents when it comes to judging. Um, anyways, I've got uh, Rafa Garcia versus Ricky Glenn. That's just a really fun fight, and I've got uh, Mahashate versus Natan Levy because they're kind of in the same boat in the sense that one, they've both lost to Rafa Garcia, but two, they're they're both guys that have a lot of physical potential, a lot of size, a lot of a lot of things to potentially build on. And a complete lack of connective tissue. <laughs> um, so make that fight happen. Brian Battle got absolutely wrestle screwed by uh, Renat Fakhardinov to the point where like there was a 30-25 scorecard. Uh, which judge gave that? Um, two actually. Oh, uh, that being said, it was Kamijo, who I'm quickly not thinking is a great one. And Natalie Bird. I guess I'll throw this in here. I have no problem with there being 10 eights in this round. I have no problem with it. But there is a certain lack of consistency with the 10 eights because we have seen fighters have to almost kill a guy to get a 10 eight. 
Fakhradinov did not do that in this fight. At no point did he almost kill Brian Battle. <laughs> um, at no point did I think the fight was going to get stopped. But Brian Battle does not have the strength, does not have the wrestling to deal with someone like this. And playing a good guard game, which Battle does have. Battle does have a legitimately good guard. Uh, is not going to win you a lot in um, in this sport. For Fakhradinov, I've got Jeremiah Wells as an opponent just because they're two big dudes, very strong, who are going to look to take each other down. And I kind of want to see what happens if... I want to see what happens if Fakhradinov can be put on the back foot. And for Brian Battle, I've got Miguel Baeza. They are two young fighters with a lot of building blocks and a lot of very, very solid potential that are just not putting it together. So I would love to see them fight. Uh, David Dvorak got uh, basically worked by by, by Mental Cop. Uh, the first round was not super, um, not super active just in general up until the Kimura that really screwed up Dvorak's arm and almost finished the fight. And then in the second round, this was the very good round for Cop. He hurt him multiple times. I think he dropped him three times. He was working some great body work, great knees to the body, and absolutely punishing him constantly. Dvorak, Dvorak was very, very close to getting finished in the second round. Third round, Cop calmed it down a little bit. Cop was still lurking some good leg kicks and so on. Uh, he was still doing some things, but he was he was doing a lot more showboating. He loves that blind crossover. I've got a basketball thing, which Dominic Cruz wants to get away from the topic of basketball as fast as possible. I get the feeling that he's not into any sport that doesn't involve combat, which is fine. That's a legitimate way to go about it. And um, that was the fight. Although appar- uh, 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 apparently there was a judge that gave Dvorak the third round. I don't see it, but I'm also not like super mad about it. Uh, Cop versus Tim Elliott would be a fun fight because I am still worried that Cop fights. Cop does not like a pace forced on him. And Tim Elliott will do that. Uh, also, I'm a little bit concerned about his ability to keep his cool and Tim Elliott will foul you. So there's that too. Uh, David Dvorak versus Sumu Darji is the fight I'm pitching. Uh, Sergei Morozov and Journey Nersim had a not particularly good ra- uh, fight. I thought the first round was kind of interesting. Newsom was doing some 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 good slipping and landing some good solid kicks, and Morozov wasn't doing much, but nothing really built for Newsom. So. Did anyone give him a round? Uh, He got a round on two cards. I'm assuming the first round. Yes. Adelaide Bird and Ron McCarthy gave him the first round. Michael Bell went 30-27. And uh, pretty much the media in general went 30-27 or 29-28. I have nothing really else to say about that fight other than... Well, no, I really, I really don't. Like, I, I was going to say Morozov is like winning me over because I was a big anti Morozov guy when he got signed. I just thought that he fought a style that he did not have the physicality to deliver on. But I still kind of feel like that. Like, I feel like that's less of a limitation, but I still kind of feel like that. And uh, there were opportunities to have a more exciting fight and maybe get a finish here, and he didn't go for them. Um. So yeah, kind of a dull fight. Newsom is doing some interesting things, but at the same time, I don't think he's very good. That does it for this episode of the Mio on MA podcast. Hope you enjoyed episode 69. And uh, yeah, um, I don't uh, I don't know if I'll be doing anything over the Christmas break, but you know, keep your keep your eyes peeled. I might do a uh, a questions podcast, and I'll um, I'll post in the Discord as well as on Twitter, uh, asking for questions, if that ends up being the case. But I I don't know at this time. I do have some family stuff, and I'm not sure what the timetable on that is going to be. Um, Nothing really further. Check out the podcast, or the podcast links, and the Discord links, and the social media links 
that are above, to the left, to the right, or below where you are listening to this right now. I will see you, well, either in the new year or soon. <laughs>